Hello everyone and uh, welcome to Rosanna COVID-19 webinar session number seven titled COVID-19 updates from the Presidential Task Force. My name is Onzi Sisemoro. I work for the Ministry of Health and Wellness and I'll be your moderator for today's session. And uh, this session is brought to you by, uh, organized by Ministry of Health and Wellness, UB and Rutgers University. So before I introduce the, uh, present, today's presenter, let me take you through the webinar house skipping rules. Uh, if you want to join the mailing list, you can do so by emailing robert at armumakwa at yahoo.com. Please mute your microphone. And uh, if you want to ask questions, you can do so through the chat uh, function and we will monitor the questions and the questions will be answered uh, throughout uh, during the course of the presentation. And uh, the sessions will be recorded and made available after the session. And uh, the previous sessions are also available on YouTube. You can just uh, Google uh, Bozana Radgas uh, University Partnership on YouTube and then you see all the previous sessions up to session number six. So even this one is going to be uploaded, uploaded on YouTube. And please, um, at the end of the session, take time and uh, fill the feedback survey because we do need your, uh, your feedback. So now let me introduce uh, today's presenter. And uh, our presenter today is uh, Professor Mosepili Mosepili, and I think he doesn't need any introduction. You all know who he is by now. And uh, he actually did a uh, webinar series number four. But uh, for those who might not know who he is, so Professor Mosipili Mosipili is the head of the Department of Internal Medicine at, at, at General Medicine and Acting Deputy Dean for Research and Graduate Education at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Botswana. He's appointed as the Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Botswana and also holds appointments with the Harvard School of Public Health and the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute Partnership. He's a specialist physician and infectious disease specialist. And uh, he is a member of the COVID-19 Presidential Task Force. So Professor Mosepil will be giving us the updates as I have said. So Professor Mosepil, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doc, uh, for inviting me. I must um, confess that uh, Dr. Hawalat would not let me say no to um, um, her request for me to present. And, and today, like last time, I actually did not prepare. Um, I think last time I kind of cheated. I had a PowerPoint slide, but today I don't. Um, what I decided to do for today was just to give you just a one minute update on where we are at and then uh, make this more interactive by um, going through some of the questions that um, colleagues have submitted or any other questions that will uh, come up during the call. Um, as you recall, um, we locked down on the 1st of um, April and uh, did a 28 day lockdown during which we detected the first 11 imported cases, uh, followed by another 12 or 13 cases as a result of local transmission. We were able to map out all of those uh, in terms of figuring out uh, the, you know, who the index was and uh, who they subsequently transmitted to. By the end of that lockdown, um, we did not have any more imported cases or evidence of local transmission. But um, because during the lockdown we had maintained what you know the Europeans or the Chinese called green channels, we did the same here. And um, as the um, outbreak was going into the thousands in South Africa, we decided that we would then start screening at the border, recognizing that whilst we had contained the initial uh, imported cases, there was a real risk of uh, new imported cases from neighboring countries. Hence why you saw that uh, when we gave an update to the uh, nation uh, at the end of the lockdown, 
we documented an increasing number of uh, imported um, cases. So that's where we are at. As of now, there's still no evidence of lookout transmission. Uh, all the cases that uh, we have uh, been able to pick up in the past few weeks as a result of um, cases detected at the border. And reassuringly so, um, you know, I'm sure you recall what um, was in social media regarding uh, the inconvenience and the long queues at the border when we implemented this strategy. Uh, the good news is that now we have really improved our processes and significantly reduced uh, delays at the border and uh, the new holding sites that have been created um, in country uh, so that um, the truck drivers do not uh, spend too much time stuck um, uh, at the border. So um, I, I thought, um, you know, I should, we should try and go through some of these questions and I'll probably try and answer a question and then maybe pause uh, for reflections and or additional comments or follow-up questions and kind of take it from there. The first question that Dr. Halath has sent me was, uh, what is the sustainability of escorting trucks? Um, you know, this issue of escorting trucks, we were, we actually have had this in our plans from way back at the beginning, because we understood and knew that Botswana imports a lot of uh, goods from South Africa. And second, uh, there are a lot of trucks uh, that um, transit through Botswana to neighboring countries like Namibia, uh, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and as far as Tanzania. So we knew that there was going to be a lot of pressure on us to ensure that uh, we can secure the nation and make it safe. And before we could actually even develop capacity to test at the border, we had a plan in place to escort trucks. And the main reason for doing so was so that if we could not test truck drivers, then we would escort them in country, monitor using she officers at point of delivery, to make sure that we know exactly where they stop and what they do when they deliver their goods. Um, and that was really the, sort of your poor man's strategy if you could not test. However, um, in the past few weeks when we made a determination that there was a substantial risk of imported COVID um, uh, by those who are supplying us with essential goods, we then decided to test um, at the borders. Um, the reason for uh, doing this now and thinking it will be sustainable is because we don't think escorting will be something that we will do for a long time. We believe that, um, for instance, that as we develop more capacity to test at the border and, and uh, reduce the waiting time, there'll be no need. Uh, for, for instance, at this stage, all the truck drivers who test negative and get their results at the border do not need to be escorted. And we've achieved this by expanding testing capacity. Uh, like in Mamuno, our border with Namibia, we are able to um, test at the border and then give out the results within an hour using the, um, the COVID-19 testing cartridge that can be used on, um, that can be used on the GeneXpert platform. Um, sorry about that. Um, I had to pause for a minute. Um, so, so we decided that then this strategy, um, we would make it convenient for everyone by, by trying to test at the border. So like I said, in Mamuno, waiting time would be about an hour. Um, we have now have capacity to test. One of our big you know, sort of um, borders will be Kasani. And now we are able to test in Kasani. We have developed capacity at Kasani Primary Hospital. Uh, we will continue to do so at other uh, points of entry. And um, we are also in the process of trying to procure more um, COVID-19 testing um, cartridges um, to use on the Gene Expert platform. So, so that will actually really help us secure uh, the nation and prevent uh, importation of disease. Now, the next question was, what about rapid tests? Um, I think we, we did touch on this at the last um, call to say that this technology is fairly new. 
uh, and that uh, a lot of the tests in this space of antibody antigen based testing are not so good uh, that our the view that uh, most people would have especially when i talk to uh, our lab scientist colleagues is whatever a rapid test we get we would probably have to study it and sort of get a better handle of its characteris um, uh, performance characteristics in our population. So I think that is still an area that needs to be um, explored um, um, in the region. And then the third question here, I think this is from the same person, was um, what about the availability of flu shots to the general population? Um, I think Botswana has plans to make this uh, available for free at public hospitals. But as you would probably guess, there has been a severe interruption of supplies of several, um, um, you know, supplies, including uh, uh, vaccines. So, for instance, I can tell you that usually in my sort of um, part-time private work, I'm able to start providing vaccines usually in mid-April. But this time around, that is not the case. Um, I have not been able to then short supply and in discussing with uh, procurement specialists, it sounds like a lot of uh, countries are in queue waiting for their flu shots to arrive. Um, uh, but uh, otherwise, I think Botswana as maybe other neighboring countries, um, we had planned to, for this year, to avoid a double hit with, uh, you know, coronavirus and influenza uh, to, to reduce um, the burden of disease from influenza by giving um, a, a flu vaccine. Uh, so, so we're hoping that we will get our supply very soon. Um, it's getting too close to the middle of winter, um, but I hope we get it. The next question that was asked here is how prepared is the country um, um, in opening the borders and anticipating influx of people coming in? Um, what I can tell you with this business is uh, the plan develops as we go along. Um, for the moment, uh, we still have uh, restrictions in allowing uh, non-essential travel into the country by um, our non-citizens. Actually, even, you know, the only people who are really allowed in are citizens. And even then, um, citizens still have to undergo quarantine. Um, we are working on plans to come up with um, an, uh, some kind of guidance on how we would allow people to enter the country for both our citizens and non-citizens and for different activities, business, you know, employees and residents and business people. Um, but it's going to depend on a lot of factors uh, in terms of where those people will be coming from, how they traveled here, um, both in the region and, and globally. So uh, in terms of preparedness, um, I, you know, I'd say for this question, testing is key. And the fundamental thing in my mind question that needs to be asked is, I've, you know, with the, un, the knowledge we have about the biology of the disease, is there another way of uh, deploying um, uh, this uh, uh, testing strategies to reduce uh, time in, in, um, in quarantine so that we facilitate people to return to some sort of near uh, new uh, normalcy versus is there a way, a different way of deploying quarantine to allow people to come back in the country? I, I doubt that there will be a massive influx of people. I think uh, life will return to some sort of new normal uh, very, very slowly. And we will all sort of keep developing our plans um, to adjust to that new normal. The next question is how safe is it um, for competitive athletes to return to activity without a vaccine or serial COVID-19 testing? Um, uh, you know, I'd say in Botswana, we have not yet allowed uh, competitive or contact sports uh, to resume yet. Uh, I think we have thus far only allowed people to go for a run or walk um, alone. Uh, gyms have opened, but there is strict um, um, uh, guidance around uh, cleaning and uh, keeping the numbers uh, to uh, a minimum in, in those uh, gymnasiums. Uh, but I'd say for competitive athletic activities, uh, we are not there yet. 
um, and I agree with the, 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 the colleague who asked the question, um, it's really hard to know what we will do with this um, without a vaccine. I'm sure you've seen pictures on TV and elsewhere where the audience is virtual and not present at um, athletic events. Um, even if we were to introduce serial COVID-19 testing in such a setting, again, we would need to continue to expand our testing capacity, which we believe is around 4,500 um, in country uh, with plans to, uh, to continue to increase that. Um, the next question that was posed was how um, can we deal with the growing number of trackers uh, who are a greater uh, risk uh, for us uh, in country? Uh, you know, I, I think the, the answer to this question is potentially do what we did, which is test at the border. Um, but, but, but the second, you know, question, you know, they, they, they said far much more fundamental, I think, in my view, you know, not being a business person or a trucker, um, that comes into my mind to say, why don't we have, uh, for instance, um, um, you know, use of trains. Um, what happened with our railway lines? Why couldn't we use that to minimize the number of people um, uh, driving, you know, a small container across our borders? You know, that, that would significantly reduce the number of people we would have to um, uh, screen uh, for, for spreading uh, COVID-19. The other question is, you know, you know what, what about um, uh, dry ports? Um, I'm sure you had the Honorable Minister of Transport make an announcement, I think two days ago, saying that uh, now we are allowing truckers at the border to uh, drive up to the border, uh, leave um, the load or the trailer at the border and have um, someone on the Botswana side pick that up and drive it in country after proper sanitization of the the um, uh, the trolley, or, or I don't know what they call it. Um, um, but but I think really it, it really calls for innovation around how we can do business and minimize the risk of transmission of disease. And like I said, what about the railway line? How about dry ports? And also other basic things as you know, how are nations, especially landlocked nations such as Botswana, uh, how are they going to um, increase their capacity to produce more locally so that in the event of another outbreak, which will happen at one point, um, um, our communities don't feel so vulnerable uh, in terms of um, uh, basic supplies such as food. Uh, so, so I think this, this question of, of truck drivers really I, in my view, does not really uh, speak to the individual people themselves, but a, a far much more fundamental, um, um, uh, you know, issue around the way we do business uh, and um, uh, our risk of uh, not having our own uh, adequate supply of foods locally. Uh, the next question is: um, Is there a psychological program to deal with the aftermath uh, effects of COVID nineteen? Uh, for those who were infected um, and in the workplace. Um, I'll say that I'm not aware of any specific uh, program, but I'd say I think for colleagues who have um, been engaged and taking part of uh, uh, fellow uh, citizens who uh, were infected with the virus, I think uh, healthcare providers at different levels have provided counseling uh, and leverage on our existing support structures like social workers, which is probably the most um, accessible means to get support. Um, but I think it's an area that we can probably do more um, in a, you know, not just for the, those who are, are in fact, were infected or exposed, but also for our um, uh, frontline workers. Um, so I think this is really a gap that, that, uh, that probably needs a, a little bit of more work and attention. Um, the next question, uh, what is the medical rationale for keeping the alcohol ban as healthcare facilities are ready now for COVID? Um, I mean, I don't, um, healthcare facilities are now ready. Oh, okay. I don't know whether the question is saying that the alcohol ban was imposed because healthcare facilities were not ready for COVID and now they are ready. Uh, there is no, I mean, healthcare facilities can be as ready as they want to be but there is not much to offer at a healthcare facility uh, for someone with COVID. Um, um, it's mostly supportive care. 
we don't have access to um, um, the only agent that I'm aware of that seems to uh, reduce duration of symptoms and that particular antiviral. I haven't read the study in detail myself, uh, but uh, it's what well, I know is it's still not yet available. Um, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if um, colleagues paid attention to the manner in which we introduce the restrictions with the different regulations uh, signed by the Director of Health Services. If you recall, with regard to alcohol, um, and that speaks to, again, another more fundamental societal issue, is when we started um, in this, um, initially we said um, um, alcohol um, is um, to be purchased and not consumed um, on site, which is a standing, especially for bottle stores in Botswana that consumption should not happen there. And that continued to be the case. Our law enforcement officers reported that being the case. And then we said, okay, maybe it will be only in sit down places uh, like liquor restaurant. And we said there should be social distancing and the reports we're getting from law enforcement officers would be things such as um, people gathering um, sitting outside in big groups and then claiming that they're doing social distancing. And then as you would know, um, after a few drinks, uh, social distancing becomes a little bit difficult to enforce as people start to get closer to each other um, and um, do not adhere to the rules. So to be honest, it's, it's, this is an issue I think that you know, needs to be addressed by different sectors to sort of say how best, and, and sometimes we think up to the villages in Botswana where we drink traditional brew, and especially around this time of the year when we are harvesting, uh, we um, you know, would be making, if it were not for COVID, we would be making um, you know, traditional brew from watermelon uh, and all other kinds of things. Um, um, and, and you um, would know, especially for those that swan, that um, in those instances, there's a lot of people who would share in the way they drink. We, we serve alcohol in one continent and pass it on, on, on to uh, the person seated next to you. So there's a lot of issues I think that need to be worked out around this issue of how do you make alcohol safely available. But I think it's more than just... Um, a health or COVID issue. I think there are multiple sectors in this space uh, that uh, need to be um, coming on board to assist. I mean, the same could apply for important things such as, um, you know, funerals, where we had to make some regulations that really have significantly altered the way Botswana conduct their burials or say goodbyes uh, to their family members, um, really showing the pervasive nature of this disease. Uh, when was the last time Botswana recorded a local transmission? I don't have the dates, um, but I'd say it would be sometime in the second or third week of April. Um, has the criteria changed? Um, for test, has the criteria for testing changed due to local transmission? Um, I don't think it has. It, it stays the same. Uh, we, we still do um, you know, screening for those with symptoms. Um, or those who we think have been exposed um, and we have maintained quarantine for anyone entering the country and testing them prior to releasing them out from quarantine. The next question, um, kindly provide a layout structure organogram of the COVID-19 response body um, and importantly its composition. Um, and there's a list here of the task force, uh, New York, um, MOHW, Director of Health, and how the systems integrate. It's actually one thing. Um, the body that really oversees everything is the uh, Presidential Task Force, which is chaired uh, by His Excellency the President. Um, in his absence, His Honor the Vice President will chair. Um, within this task force, there are several members of the cabinet, uh, permanent secretaries, uh, in members of the community, including representation from um, uh, religious groups, uh, business groups, uh, and many others. So that is the composition of the presidential task force. The task force has a small group uh, of a coordination office, uh, which is the presidential task team headed by um, uh, Dr. Masuku, and I, I deputize him. And we have uh, colleagues in there, Dr. Matsaba and, and many others 
from different functions, logistics, uh, communications, and many other functions. The NEWARC, which is the National Emergency Operations Center, is one of our command centers. We, we run two command centers purely out of um, trying to protect everyone who's involved in this. We could not have everyone who is very you know, strategically who's involved in this seated at one command center. So New York is one of our command centers. The Ministry of Health is the lead ministry in this exercise. As I said, within the presidential task force, there are several members of cabinet and therefore Ministry of Health will be represented by the Honorable Minister. And again, the question about the Director of Health is a, you know, a, a key uh, leader in this exercise, as um, you would know, according to the Botswana Public Health Act of 2013, um, the office that has the authority to give us all the directions we've been giving to the com community is the director of, of health services. So he is very integral and part of this and sits in all of this, um, uh, uh, you know, as a member of the task force and also as a member of the task team. So it's really one uh, integrated um, group, even though it may be a different functions. Um, and then there's a question about, um, I think this question about mental health, I, we addressed it earlier as a repeat question, probably by a different uh, participant, uh, but to say that uh, it's, it's a gap that um, um, has been there prior to COVID, but maybe COVID is just exposing this uh, limitation even more uh, specific guidelines on quarantine um, uh, as uh, to be followed in the event of healthcare worker uh, who tests positive. We do have specific guidelines for both quarantine and isolation, and they continue to be um, um, improved uh, and developed. One of the areas that um, you know we really, really interested to get into is the idea of using electronic solutions uh, for 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 isolation and quarantine and uh, reduce the, the human factor in uh, monitoring and enforcing uh, quarantine or isolation. So, you know, if it is one thing that we would hopefully have developed capacity to do uh, using electronic solutions will be in the space of quarantine and isolation, which will not only benefit us for COVID, but will extend to other diseases where we have to quarantine and isolate people beyond COVID. Um, uh, the position, our position on rapid testing, I think I already alluded to this, to say even when this comes into play here, I think it ought to be studied so we know more about performance characteristics of um, rapid testing in our population. Um, I think this next question is about the same, about you know, should companies that um, wish to do rapid testing for their employees be encouraged to do so, I would say such companies should work with um, accredited labs for COVID-19 testing or scientists who know enough about how to evaluate um, such tests so that they are provided with um, the right um, advice so they do it properly. I can briefly tell you that our experience in this space has been that um, um, at, at least for people, some people who are coming back to Botswana, we have picked up a lot of false positives where people were coming to Botswana having done a rapid test at um, another country only for us to then on follow-up establish that uh, those were actually um, um, uh, false uh, positives. So I think it's, it's, it's something that we need to, to look at um, uh, very closely. Um, what uh, do I think uh, the trajectory um, is going to be for the Botswana epidemic? I think if we, if we do everything that we've been sort of uh, preaching um, in country, uh, I'm hopeful we should be fine, but I'm very mindful of the fact that there's this real risk of uh, imported disease. I'll tell you this, um, whether it's, it's through truck um, drivers who, you know, it's not their fault, they're just bringing what we need them to bring for us. Um, there's also the real risk of um, our border communities. If you recall, you know, if you go to the Northeast, we have on the Botswana side, we have lots of relatives on the Zimbabwe side. If you go into the South border of Botswana, we have relatives across the border. And in some of these small village communities or border communities, uh, people move fairly easily uh, across the border. So it's, it's one area that I think we need to pay attention to and figure out how to 
provide robust surveillance plans along uh, border communities um, to detect any infections um, very, very early. Um, so the other question is, is uh, the validity of a negative test for truck drivers. Yes, I accept um, uh, this question of, you know, shouldn't you wait and then repeat it? Um, Again, this is a balancing act of trying to be practical and allow movement of goods. Botswana is a signatory um, of uh, many, um, you know, agreements with neighboring countries, the SADC and the like. So one has to sort of, and again, some of these medicines are what goods are things we need urgently in Botswana. So we really um, are aware that you know it's not entirely adequate but it's very useful um, in that most of the people who are delivering in Botswana, they come in and deliver and you know, mostly are back the same day or the following day or be transiting through Botswana within a day or so. So even though it might not completely eliminate risk, we believe that it uh, is a significant um, um, uh, strategy to reduce um, the risk. Um, uh, the linkages um, with SADC to make sure there's coordination. This always happens in the context of a disease outbreak. I can't speak competently to it, but uh, I would not be surprised if uh, nations were talking or ministers or permanent secretary were talking to their counterparts uh, to assist and guide each other on how to respond um, uh, to the epidemic and minimize disruptions whilst protecting their own communities. Uh, there are cases uh, being picked up in neighboring Zimbabwe, and those are said to have uh, uh, um, come from Botswana. Um, I think a lot of this, uh, you know, it's not new. We, you know, you may not have had, you know, these things happen all the time about someone turning positive um, after arriving in another country. And typically when we hear of such stories, um, um, there will be a plan to contact the right officials in that country and then get more details about um, how they, you know, get more information about the movements of the people involved um, and make a, a, a determination as to whether we think um, the infection might have been present while those people were in Botswana or whether those people um, picked up um, the infection um, in their own home country or in quarantine because of breach of quarantine rules. So, it's something that when we, we hear about it, uh, this, what you've seen from the media on, on WhatsApp about Zimbabwe is not new. We've, we've had other countries report back to us um, and we always investigate all those cases. And when we make a determination that there's a risk for some people in Botswana, we reach out to them um, as part of contact tracing. What kind of electronic solutions are being considered to monitor? I can only speak to what we want. We want to be able to, uh, electronic solutions to monitor quarantine isolation. All I can say is we, we're looking at ways to re, you know, reduce the human sort of element of it, but be able to know where people are and whether they have breached quarantine or isolation rules and moved out of where they should be. Uh, so and then, uh, in terms of the specifics, I'd leave that to the technical people to do that uh, without really dwelling on too much uh, uh, detail. Um, the use of gene experts um, platform for COVID-19 testing, um, is this new? As far as I know, it's a new thing because the virus is also new. Um, um, I cannot speak with um, um, lots of uh, confidence about the the but the question is has it been validated against other tools i cannot give the numbers in terms of its performance characteristics compared to uh, the other big pcr machines but uh, except to say that um, it is also pcr based technology and uh, our lab scientists have approved it uh, for use in botswana um, um, are known positive specimens being kept so that they can be uh, used to validate. I'm not sure of the details in the lab in terms of how long they store samples um, and what um, follow-up operational research they are planning to do. Um, so I'll leave that to the scientists. Is it advisable to open schools? Um, at one point, schools have to open. Uh, the question is when and how and who? Is it everyone in that school? Uh, should it be some I'm sure you've seen the you know, practice around the world where others 
go for the very young and other communities, they go for the slightly older pupils uh, or, 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 or you know, your, your university students. But I'd say at one point it has to happen. Um, the debate of whether it's safe or not, I think will continue. Um, but you know, the, I think the job here is to make, to try and make our schools as safe as possible, to put measures in place, uh, to um, identify anyone who ends up in a school with disease and, and isolate them and, 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 and follow our quarantine and isolation protocols. Um, again, as I said earlier, given the fact that we have not had a case of lookout transmission since end of April, um, and uh, currently we are, I think, close to 17, 18,000 tests performed locally. Um, and all the positive tests we have had in the past few weeks um, um, uh, for our colleagues who are, are, are truck drivers. So, uh, you know, without sounding too confident, um, it, it's probably reasonable to say that it's, it's very unlikely that there is extensive community transmission that would preclude opening of schools. But in opening the schools, we should be very, very careful um, uh, to monitor for symptoms and um, have a robust uh, surveillance program in place. Um, criteria conditions for private sector facilities. Um, I think our national lab with the other partners um, are working with um, any private facility that's interested in, in testing because we would have to review um, what they do and eventually have the national lab certify them and potentially even verify some of their results um, as, as sort of a quality control measure. Um, what is envisaged waiting time for trackers as they enter Botswana before they continue in their business? Uh, is it advisable to have a holding bay nearest to the port of entry? Um, this really varies from where people enter. Um, you know, um, if, if you enter in through Klokweng, which is, you know, half an hour to our lab or so, and you happen to arrive at a point where you're swapped and we are ready to run a plate, your waiting time may be as short as seven hours or so, or six hours um, if you um, are in that batch. So it really varies in terms of where you are, but we have um, uh, said we would minimize this to less than 24 hours uh, with, uh, as we open more labs around the country. Uh, is that advisable to have a holding bay nearest to port of entry? We are already working on this. When we started this protocol, we, we actually used um, um, way bridges as, um, as um, um, a holding base. And I think government is working around the corner to create additional spaces. Um, I'm sure you've seen that in Loba, say we use the stadium. There's an additional place being uh, set up. I think it has already been set up in Kasani. In Khaburun, we are using fairgrounds as a holding bay after the port of entry. So this is an ongoing exercise and, and hopefully we will soon have a, a dry port at some point. Um, now uh, the question is, we are entering the respiratory season. Uh, are there plans to upscale testing, um, um, especially um, in patients admitted with respiratory illness? Um, Yes, I think, um, and also do, are we going to test for other respiratory viruses? Again, all of this are in our plans. I mean, like, like I said, we have capacity in and around Harborin to do 3,000 tests um, every 24 hours. And by expanding to Francistown, Kasani, and others, we will probably um, will be close to 4,500 or 5,000. 4, so I think there is capacity to test um, and there will be even more capacity when we get our consignment of the gene expert platform uh, our testing material. Um, so so I, th I think we should be able to cope. Um, and in terms of looking for other respiratory viruses, um, I think there are, just as I said, with the vaccine, there are plans to do that this year. Um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work uh, but one that I think is worth it, uh, if we can emerge out of this epidemic and um, having set up some kind of um, um, influenza-like illness surveillance program where we can test for, not just for SARS-CoV-2, but other respiratory uh, pathogens. So I, I'm still, I still am hopeful that our colleagues um, 
uh, in the lab and, and elsewhere would, would help us um, to get other um, uh, reagents so that we test for more than just SARS-CoV-2 uh, be, before the end of this winter. Uh, Doc, I think I have gone through all the questions on email, plus the questions that were posted um, uh, since the call started. Um, and the last question we just popped up is testing in Francistown and Kasani. Kasani has started already, uh, and the result uh, locally. Francistown, they were supposed to have started, but I think it was a glitch in equipment, and I think um, either they're going to try and repurpose another machine for there, or maybe Palape will start before uh, Francis Town. But, but again, the plan is to expand testing to many more sites. Uh, Doc Tissimo. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the presentation. And indeed, you have addressed all the questions that we, they were forwarded to you and those that were asked through the chat box. But let me just find out from the audience if there are maybe one or two with burning questions that may, might not have been addressed during your presentation. Audience, anyone with a, a burning question that they want to ask or a comment or a suggestion? While they're still thinking, I see um, another question. Um, uh, oh, okay. No, this was sent privately, so I won't answer the question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So, anyone, or we are okay? Um, one of my colleagues just asked about availability of flu vaccine. Um, we are waiting for an order. Uh, we have asked that this be made available. Um, and we would have sufficient doses, I think, to cover people who are at highest risk, uh, uh, frontline staff, the elderly, those with comorbidities, and, and, and for the frontline staff, that would include um, healthcare providers. And then the next question is, um, with uh, no local transmission uh, since April, when do we plan to do away the interzonal restrictions. You know, part of the reason for the interzonal restrictions is not because there is a ongoing local transmission. It is to really divide up the country so that in the event that there's an outbreak, we don't do a national lockdown. If you recall when we updated the nation um, at the end of the lockdown, in the Botswana setting, because of how mobile we are, uh, in certain instances, uh, uh, when you did contact tracing for a particular case, you'd find that the contacts have, um, you know, gone or traveled to as, you know, you know, as far across the country as, let's say, in one instance, 10 districts. And that really creates a big problem in terms of the likelihood of disease spread and the resources that you need to go to um, so many places around the country to to do contact tracing. So really, this, these zones are not to limit or eliminate known local transmission, but they are also meant to be able to help us contain the disease in the event of um, a, um, um, a new uh, a detected case. As you recall with one of the truck drivers who had entered Haburoni, we were able to just zone Haburoni within the greater Haburoni zone and, and lock um, Haburoni down and not, um, you know, disrupt um, people um, elsewhere. So these zones are really meant to sort of, again, contain the disease and, and minimize um, a risk of spread to the rest of the country. Okay, thank you. But I think, Sydney, you have a question. I see your hand is up. Hi, thank you, Dr. Uh, Prof, thank you very much for that uh, update. Uh, I'm doing a follow-up on the gene expect uh, question uh, because uh, TD program is one of the programs that have been using gene expect, and they were using it uh, uh, as an initial, uh, initial diagnostic tool, not a follow-up uh, tool. Now I'm asking this in terms of COVID-19. You find that uh, it might peak uh, for, for, for those who have already recovered it might peak uh, saying that they are still positive, whereas they are not uh, positive. 
I don't know, are there any plans in terms of uh, trying to address those issues? Or what are we supposed to do in terms of uh, those issues whereby the gene expert is saying someone is positive? Thank you. Um, excellent question. Um, that, that, that concern actually it's still you know, applies for the other PCR machines that we do in the lab. That um, with this technology, I think, I don't know if this question came up in the last call, that um, they pick RNA material. It may be dead material or live material. But I think most um, experts have opted to be more conservative for a new disease and assume that any uh, positive uh, COVID-19 test um, on PCR testing should be treated as someone who's infectious. So I expect the same thing to happen with the, with the um, gene expert platform. I think in the early phase of the epidemic, it's probably wise to treat those people as potentially infected and infectious and you know, um, isolate them. But I think as we learn more about this disease in terms of uh, uh, the virus uh, viability and potential to cause infection, we may get to a stage where, as with TB, you know, if you have a good history of when the person has been treated and you know a lot more about that clinical condition, you may opt to call it, um, um, you know, um, a red herring in that it could be just dead RNA material from a prior infection. So I think we will get to that, but I don't think there's a lot of appetite at the moment to say a positive um, PCR test is um, a recovery uh, and should be left alone. I hope I answered your question. No, you did. Anyone or we have four minutes. Four minutes left. <laughs> we can wrap up early. Okay. No, I think yeah, and no, I just wanted to give them the chance. You know, some of us we take time to you know to think. We think slowly. Okay, I think thank you, Professor Mosepile, for your time, for the great presentation, and thank you, Dr. Raulati, for not taking no for an answer. So maybe you wouldn't be here. So, and thank you for the our audience. There wouldn't be any webinar without you, the audience. So we thank you also for your precious time. And uh, please don't forget to don't forget to fill up the the, um, the survey at the end of the at the end of the session. Thank you so much for your time. And the Thanks next session, the next session is going to be next week, Thursday. We'll send the invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor.